good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you join our sixth MRD talk, uh, which is entitled How Can Knowledge Support the Restoration and Conservation of Mountain Ecosystems for the Benefit of People and Nature? So MRD talks are online dialogues which are conducted by the editorial team of the Mountain Research and Development uh, Journal. These online dialogues uh, aim to promote an exchange between science, practice, and policy, and they are based on uh, papers published in our journal MRD and also in other sources of knowledge. It is, uh, they are supported by a project called CRIMA, Promoting Innovations in Mountain Areas, which is funded by the Austrian Development Agency and which is conducted uh, by MRD together with UNEP. This is our sixth talk. We're really um, excited um, to have great panelists joining us today. And with this talk, we would like to contribute uh, specifically to the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which is running from 2021 until 2030. We would also like to contribute to International Mountain Day, which will be on 11th of December, and which will also focus on uh, mountain restoration. We understand not only assisting in the recovery of ecosystems that have been degraded or destroyed, but also to the conservation of ecosystems that are still intact. And we are here adopting the definition uh, taken by the UN Decade on Restoration. So in this talk, we've invited four uh, great panelists which are involved in knowledge production from different approaches and will, who will share their insights with us. I will give you more details about our panelists uh, when I introduce them. Next slide. And the talk will be organized in two main parts. The first half of the talk, a bit over the half of the talk, we will have four uh, short presentations by our panelists. Uh, first, Estefania Cuenta who will share the results from a study on restoration activities around the world and how they relate to the 10 UN restoration principles. Then we will have Tatenda Lehmann, who will present the World Overview of Conservation Approaches and Technologies tool and how it supports the restoration and conservation of mountain ecosystems. And third, we will have a presentation by Devin Holterman on advancing evidence informed conservation from a social science approach. And he will present an agenda for the Yellowstone to Yukon region in the US and Canada. And lastly, Rob Merchant will uh, present, uh, make an input on the value of mountain ecosystems for sustainable development from an historical perspective. So this will be the first half of our talk. And then we will have a more interactive part with all of you, with our panelists, but also with all of you who are joining from different parts of the world. And we will use um, a tool called the open uh, technology space, open space technology, which is quite simple. I will explain it to you and which will uh, allow for lively discussions. And we will then convene back for a joint synthesis. Next slide. Maybe before inviting Estefania to uh, give her talk, I would like to say that after each talk, we will have just a very short time uh, to answer one or two questions from the audience. So if you have questions during the talk, please write them in the chat, use the chat function of the Zoom. And at the end of each presentation, we will take the time to answer one to two questions. There will be much more time for more in-depth discussions in the second part of the talk, as already explained. So now I would like to invite Estefania Cuenta. Estefania is a research associate at the Instituto de Ecología of the University Mayor de San Andres in La Paz, Bolivia. And she's also an active member of the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. 
Stefania, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah Lam, for the introduction. It's an honor for me to stay here today with you. I'm going to present you part of an analysis of mountain restoration activities related to the term restoration principles of the United Nations to guide the United Nations decade on ecosystem restoration. So what is the objective of the United Nations decade on ecosystem restoration and what are the principles? Uh, the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration was declared by the United Nations. Sorry. So the objective of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration was declared between the years 2021 and 2030 that aims to help prevent and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide and achieve global goals such as the Sustainable Development Goals to support the implementation of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration and to create a shared vision of ecosystem restoration, 10 principles were adapted to underpin all of the restorative activities that are part of the continuum of ecosystem restoration, which are applicable across all sectors, biomes, and regions. The 10 principles are the next. First, ecosystem conservation contributes to the sustainable development goals and the goals of the Rio Conventions. Two, ecosystem restoration promotes inclusive and participatory governance, social fairness, and equity. Three, ecosystem restoration involves many types of activities. Four, ecosystem restoration aims to achieve the highest level of recovery for biodiversity, ecosystem health, integrity, and human well being. Five, ecosystem restoration addresses the direct and indirect causes of ecosystem degradation. And six, ecosystem restoration incorporates all types of knowledge sorry, incorporates all types of knowledge and promotes their exchange and integration throughout the process. So there is a specific principle regarding knowledge integration. Seven, ecosystem restoration is based on ecological, cultural, and socioeconomic objectives and goals. Eight, ecosystem restoration is tailored to the ecological, cultural, and socioeconomic context while considering the larger landscapes or seascapes. Nine, ecosystem restoration includes monitoring, evaluation, and adaptive management throughout and beyond the lifetime of the project. And nine, ecosystem restoration is enabled by policies and measures that promote its long-term progress, fostering replication, and scaling up. So this is a very brief summary of the principles. For more specific information, you can find the principles in the website of FAO and also in the website on the decade on restoration. So as I mentioned before, there is a specific principle regarding knowledge integration. A more details of this principle is that ecosystem restoration incorporates all types of knowledge, such as indigenous, traditional, local, and scientific knowledge. It fosters inclusive and consensual decision-making and enables full participation. It promotes mutual learning and knowledge sharing, which is very important to develop, adapt, and replicate successful experiences and to avoid repeating mistakes. And also the incorporation of knowledge should comply with the principles of free, prior, and informed consent. To highlight how these principles can be applied to mountain ecosystems and also to understand how these principles were addressed in restoration projects in mountain regions worldwide, we review case studies on restoration in mountain regions worldwide. Each case study was evaluated against the same principles to understand to what extent these principles were addressed in the restoration process, and also to provide first recommendations on how these principles can be applied to the context of mountain ecosystems. These case studies cover a variety of ecosystems, such as forests, grasslands, soils, rivers, and also they were located in different mountain regions, such as Carpathian Mountains, European Alps, Rocky Mountains, the Andes, Australian Alps, and many mountain regions in China. And these ecosystems were located in different climatic zones, tropical, subtropical, and temperate zones. They cover also different elevational gradients. And some projects started a long time ago, such as the restoration case of Polylepis Forest in the Andes of Argentina that started 25 years ago, and others started recently. Um, also, these case studies emerged from a variety of organizations, such as governments, NGOs, local communities, research groups, and individual scientists. So as you can realize, there is a high variability of mountain restoration projects, and we try to include this variability in our analysis. Each case study uh, incorporates mainly scientific knowledge, mainly during the evaluation of the restoration activity that were published 
in scientific journals. And also they suggested that they incorporated local knowledge during the meetings that they had during the planning phase of the restoration activity, and also during the participation of the local communities. However, more specific information and the documentation of the specific process of knowledge integration was missed for most of the cases. A great case study was the restoration of bugials and meadows in the central Himalaya. This ecosystem was extremely degraded by uh, overgrazing and tourism, producing extreme soil erosion that is technically called as galley erosion. So they needed to recover first the structure of the soil, and they did this by installing check dams made of natural and local materials and health textiles, as you can observe in the photos. Local communities were also interested in recovering the ecosystem because they usually collect medicinal plants, which are very important for their local traditional knowledge, and also they participated in the restoration activity. As you can realize, this project might have not been possible to do without the integration of knowledge, technical, scientific, and local knowledge, and local knowledge in various aspects, for instance, knowledge for how long the ecosystem was degraded, what were the main factors of the degradation, how to control overgrazing or tourism during the restoration activity, or if they participated in the design of the methodology of the restoration method. Therefore, the main recommendations for knowledge integration to mountain ecosystem restoration is that mountain ecosystem restoration should integrate all kinds of knowledge and the best management practices related to the ecosystem to be restored. And the documentation of this specific process uh, is very important for various reasons. For instance, it helps us to identify previous successful and unsuccessful restoration activities of the mountain ecosystem in order to implement the best restoration practices, to understand the prior state of the ecosystem to set proper restoration objectives, to recognize potential ecosystems of references to support the decisions regarding the desired level of restoration to be achieved, to identify useful indicators for the monitoring and evaluation of the restoration, and to identify and replicate good practices that local and indigenous communities have created to cope with the climatic conditions of the isolated mountain areas. Just to finalize, uh, this photo I took a long time ago in an opportunity that I had here in Bolivia, visiting an indigenous community, Amarete. We had the opportunity to work with the students and you can observe that they are drawing maps of their territory from which we learn many things about how they manage their landscapes and also their natural resources. But this is just one tiny example of what projects usually do. And the documentation of these methodologies is very important, not only to the benefit of our restoration project, but also to my opinion, to guarantee the transparency of the process of knowledge integration. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stefania. That was very, uh, very interesting. And of course, we would like to learn more and we will go to the to the resources that you shared. Is there any specific question uh, for Stefania Cuenta? Uh, if so, please write it in the chat right now. Just very specific questions related to her presentation. As we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned before, there will be quite uh, some time for further interaction in the second part of our talk. I don't see any question. I think uh, everything was crystal clear. <laughs> Thank you, Estefania. So, sorry, oh, I, I hope see... it was clear. Um, there were noisy here. And deeply sorry no, it, for that. it, it was thank very clear. Much. We could hear you very well. And um, so thank you so much, uh, Estefania. And I would like now to invite our second panelist, Tatenda Lehmann, who is a senior research uh, scientist at the Center for Development and Environment of the University of Bern. He's also part of the executive team of WOCAT, which is the World Overview of Conservation Approaches and Technologies. And we will learn more about, about this uh, with his presentation. Tatenda, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sarlan. So I would like to continue a little bit with a collection of case studies and good practices that we have heard from Estefania. And, Yes, first of all, a warm welcome also from my side. It's really a big pleasure to talk to you about WOCAT and its support to the restoration and conservation of mountain ecosystems. And in addition to what we have learned about the ecosystem, you went decade on ecosystem restoration, I may also add here, maybe you also already know that mountains are actually one of the eight defined categories of ecosystems for the UN decade 
on ecosystem restorations and of course but different to other ecosystems like farmlands or forests and so on mountains are not a, an ecosystem that in, in the sense of a dominant land use type let's call it that way so there are a mixture of different ecosystems what we have seen before in the presentation of Estefania and the different um, case studies where they were located so those mountains capes are mosaics but their classes uh, are classed as ecosystem because of their still speci special characteristic characteristics i mean by definition the land is sloping and vulnerable to surface uh, surface erosion as well as mass wa wasting it's like accessibility is often poor and altitude limits production i mean i think you are all experts in mountains and i don't have to tell you that but i think this is exactly what it makes difficult of this remoteness and also these mosaics often knowledge and evidence for really informed decision making are dispersed and or sometimes even simply lacking and that's actually where we meaning WOCAT are aiming to also have a role but to explain that I would like to give you a short introduction about WOCAT and what it actually is um, so it is a network of called World Overview of Conservation Approaches and Technologies, a network of experts in the in the field of sustainable land management. It was established already more than 30 years ago, right after the Rio Convention in 92. So um, it is formalized and defined by the framework agreement with seven consortium partners that you can see listed here. I mean, you can see all the, the logos. I mean, worth mentioning with maybe ECMOT as one of our mountain partners or the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. And they celebrate a 40th anniversary this year. So all the knowledge is actually um, linked with them related to mountains. So in 2014 then, since then WOCAT is officially recognized by the UNCCD, so the UN decade, uh, uh, um, UN Convention to combat desertification as the primary recommended database for best practice reporting, meaning that UNCCD parties can use the platform to report their best practice from the countries towards the convention and the databases are directly linked. So WOCAT supports innovation and decision-making sustainable land management actually by the following four pillars. First, maintaining a global open network, what I mentioned before, with many engaged individual, but also institutional members, where you all can become institu institutional or individual member of WOCAT. Nowadays, we have uh, members from more than 50 countries. And then the second pillar is a little bit the core of WOCAT, the open access database, which contains a series of standardized tools and methods for knowledge management, decision support in sustainable land management, and then weekly we get new documented good practices also from mountain areas and the database is being reused really by different stakeholders from around the globe. And very important to stress is the first pillar actually WOCAT is supporting projects and institutions to build their capacities in the assessment of land degradation and devaluation of potential sustainable land management solution. So we are thereby report, rep, uh, responding to the requests coming from project programs or institutions or individuals who would like to use WOCAT tools and methods. Finally, pillar four, and uh, where we are harmonizing and further developing our tools and methods. I mean, I think we all know there are so many tools that pumping up all over the world almost weekly and they disappear again after maybe one or two years or after the project ends. And so it's really difficult to find the right information, the right tool. And so there we, we do not end that everybody's using WOCAT, but actually our objective is that wherever possible existing tools are being considered and linked to not reinvent the wheel again and again, and also to make life of users as easy as possible. So um, actually, we differentiate between the SLM technology, which is a physical practice that controls land degradation and the approach, actually those are ways and means used to implement one or several technologies. And those technologies and pra practice can be documented with the standardized questionnaire in our database before it is then going through a review process. And once we have a certain quality ensured, it is being published on our database, but not on, only on the database itself. So really there is also an automatically generated summary where you can find all the information um, and 
so here you can see what what kind of information we are actually collecting so really information about what is the technology about or the approach how it is being implemented so what are the technical specification that someone else maybe in somewhere else in another ecosystem can adapt this technology and what are the costs of course always related to specific environment and then where it is implemented of course very crucial because there was a case studies what is in natural environment and then the impacts and the benefits and I think this is very key also for mountain areas that we also not only looking at on-site impacts but also off-site impacts since we if we are doing something on-site in the mountains it almost always has an impact on maybe areas for countries further downstream um, this in short and I mean those Summaries are often being used for both best practice compilations, learning materials for extension services, and so on. And we also used it for actually a publication um, together with UNCCT for the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. There we showed that we had, there are good practices for all of the eight ecosystem categories, such like as mountains, and we're showcasing on the ground good practices as evidence. So really to give the voice to those who are doing it because we really believe in it and um, we have to learn from those who have experience and are doing it. And linked to that, we also have then videos for the different ecosystems where we have the good practices. Um, so you can find all the information with the QR code, but I think it's too fast anyway, then I will just put the link into the chat and you will also find it in the MRT um, website. Very briefly, I mentioned the linkages of tools and here just an example, the information is not only available on the WOCAD platform database, it also can be accessed through the application program interface, so-called API, where actually here as an example, the information is being linked to the framework for ecosystem restoration monitoring. This is the rest, uh, monitoring platform of the UNDCAD, where the good practices or actually all the projects related to restoration are being collected. And so all the technologies in the WOCAD database related to um, restoration are then to appear automatically through the API once they are published in our platform, in this platform as well, and in the firm platform as well. And also there is the interface that automatically through the platform, you can document the good practice through the WOCAD database. But coming back to the mountains, of course, so you can see this is not a very new figure. A few years ago, we analyzed so in which actually mountain classes we have good practices. And you can see that still we have um, good practices from all over the world, but still important mountain areas are missing. Nowadays, we have, of course, more technologies and approaches, but still, and I think the mountain classes are a bit, the distribution is similar to what you can see here. And with that, then we also can make the, actually analysis on the degradation types for the different mountain classes as an example. And we can see here that the most dominant degradation type in most of the classes are actually is soil erosion by water. But we have heard the mosaics and it's very complex and complicated. So all degradation types are represented and appear in the, mount, um, the mountain ecosystems. Yeah, with that, I'm already coming to some recommendations actually for leveraging information exchange and, and production really to effectively support restoration and conservation of mountain ecosystems, not only for the benefits of people, but also for nature. And there a little bit, we um, suggest to, fo to follow the principles that are also the principles of WOCAT that, that we need to have tools, methods, apply to really generate the data and the evidence that's key, but also in a harmonized and standardized way that allows really the exchange and the comparison and also the analysis. And then um, data and the knowledge needs to be open access and also easy to access. So everybody needs to find the information they are looking for. And it needs to also be somehow what I mentioned before, integrate a platform that lasts beyond the duration of a project, maybe also you are beyond the, the boundaries of institutions working in a project that you can be shared widely. And of course, very important, we also heard before from Stefania, I mean, core development, core production is key for this information to really have someone who is behind it, who has the evidence and the knowledge on these technologies. And of course, very important link to what I said before, 
it has to be the knowledge need to be prepared for the different audiences so be it really someone working on the ground politicians or academic uh, academia so really this knowledge should be made available in the specific context also then of course at the local national regional even at the global level and yeah with that thanks a lot and i would like to hand over to you well, thank you very much uh, tatenda that was very interesting and as uh, we mentioned you will find the link to walk at also on the MRD webpage where you have the description of the talk with the link to all these uh, important resources. I see that there are two uh, specific questions to you, uh, Tatenda, one from Ketema Bekele, would tell us the impact benefits of a sample of sustainable land management in monitoring terms. Um, I suppose this is a question related to the information that is available in WOCAT. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Dave. Do we have time for a short answer now or it's later? Uh, yes, a brief answer. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Thank the impacts you. and the benefits are mostly qualitative collected information. So it's a rather expert assessment. And then we don't have the monetary terms behind it. Most cases, of course, we also then collect additional information, the quantitative information behind it. But this is really the tricky point to really monetize all those ecosystem benefits as well to really have a proper cost benefit analysis. And we are working actually on a new model, a module for that that is being linked then with our mm -hmm. database. Thank you. And next question from Krishna Gautam. What were the data collected to analysis? Can you explore with examples? I'm not sure I understand quite the question. Is it a general question or was it uh, specific to the example that was presented? Krishna, maybe you can specify your question. Or maybe I can try to answer it um, yes. in a general yes. way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is a standardized questionnaire with with categories behind it, with drop downs. So everybody's answering the same questions with the same possible answers. And therefore it makes it pos possible to really compare and to make this analysis. And therefore it's key for us to have these standardized tools and methods to exactly make this analysis possible. Otherwise, if you only collect some information here and there without having some definitions defined properly, then it is very difficult to start to make these comparisons and also this analysis. I don't know if that answered the question, but I'm happy to talk about it later as well. Thank you, Tatenda. This was a very clear answer. I would like now to invite our third speaker today, Devin Holterman, who is a postdoctoral fellow who leads a collaborative project uh, between the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative at the University of Northern British Columbia, Canada. And he will present the insights of a study that was published uh, in a recent paper in, uh, in our journal, Mountain Research and Development, in a focus issue dedicated to restoration in mountains. Devin, please. Great, thanks everyone. I trust you can see my slides, yes? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's great. Great to be here. Thanks to everyone uh, for uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm honored to be on this this webinar with with the co-panelists and, and all of you today. Um, I will be presenting some some kind of insights from a, a recent paper that co-authors and I developed, uh, whereby we 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 focused on uh, working on a or developing a social science research agenda for the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. Um, before really beginning, I want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from Jojage today, which is also known as the island of Montreal. It's a meeting place of many First Nations and the Ghana and Gahaga, or Mohawk Nation, who are recognized as the custodians of these lands and waters. And much of my work takes place here and across the traditional territories of many First Nations. So I wanted to, to share that with you this morning. I'll begin today's talk by introducing you to the Yellowstone to Yukon region for those who are not uh, familiar with it. This is a vast eco region that stretches across the spine of the Rocky Mountains from the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in the United States, all the way up to the Yukon territory in Northern Canada. 
The region spans 3,400 kilometers across many jurisdictions and includes at least 75 indigenous territories. And this is one of the most intact mountain regions in the world with 17.6% land protections, which you can see here on the map in green. The Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, or Y2Y, is a registered nonprofit organization that is science-based and looks to connect and protect habitat so people and nature can thrive across that entire region that I just showed you on the previous slide. Y2Y looks to set the context for biodiversity conservation with its bold vision of an interconnected landscape across many political jurisdictions and works primarily on the key issues you see here listed on the slide, including establishing ecological connectivity, supporting indigenous-led conservation and preventing human-wildlife conflict among, among other uh, areas of focus. So I've been leading a project with Y2I that looks to integrate the social sciences across its programming and decision-making in a systematic way uh, by mobilizing existing research to inform decision-making, identifying research gaps, and directing and conducting new research to address those gaps across the region. For a number of reasons, some of which listed here on the slide, we see this the, the Yellowstone to Yukon region, this peopled region, as an ideal location to investigate and develop the conservation social sciences in a systematic way. The region, uh, although uh, um, being one of the most uh, intact mountain ecosystems on the planet, it is also under threat from various of uh, from various activities. Uh, throughout the region, you see conservation uh, and restoration efforts taking place in a number of ways. Um, and this, this region also has a diversity of social groups, um, including many First Nations, uh, and of course is, uh, is an area of, of North America that's also experiencing a lot of momentum or, or seeing a lot of momentum around indigenous-led conservation, so another key uh, area of interest here. And of course, this region also continues to be modified by, by various human activities. At the same time, recent research shows that the natural sciences far outpace research in the social and health sciences in Canadian mountain regions. As McDowell and Hanley uh, rightly point out, I, I would say in their, their recent uh, paper just last year, this limits our understanding of life in the mountains and constrains management decisions looking to balance development with conservation. So this is just some of the broader context that our efforts to develop a social science research agenda for Y2I emerged. The agenda presents a list of questions that we feel if addressed could help inform decision-making in the region. Uh, we really followed similar efforts here. There's been a few other um, regional focus, uh, focused uh, social science agendas developed over the last number of years. And we were also inspired by, it's called the horizon scan method um, as well as we, as we conducted this work. And we found the research agenda setting work to be quite useful, both in understanding the knowledge gaps throughout the Yellowstone to Yukon region, but also in planning future research activities. So in effect, what, we're, what we really set out to do here was develop a guide for the organization's social science work. And that was our objective, to develop a guide for future social science work that was informed by the expertise of people working throughout the region. To do so, we circulated a survey that asked what are the important human dimensions or social science research questions that if addressed can contribute to more just and equitable conservation outcomes. From this, we received more than uh, or, uh, 40 responses from experts across the region who uh, submitted, uh, whose submissions included over 120, uh, sorry, there was over 120 different submissions um, uh, formulated mostly as research questions or research problems. That data was then supplemented with focus group discussions with Y2I staff and also a series of one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations with experts throughout the region, again, discussing key gaps in our understanding of the human dimensions of conservation in this area, in this region. And so in the end, we developed a set of 12 key questions built from participant insights that we feel can be adapted in a, in a place-specific manner to help address gaps in the overarching research themes. And you can see those questions in, in, the, in the article in mountain research and development. Four themes or four key themes really emerged that where it was clear that more primary research was needed, uh, which you can see here on the slide. As again, as we lay out in the article, uh, there are many ways that these questions if addressed can help support the conservation and restoration of mountain regions uh, as they would fill significant knowledge gaps and could help contribute to better planning, management and, and, and decision making. 
Other key insights also emerged throughout this uh, research process, including the need to advance any new research with principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in mind, and of course, to seriously consider how this research can engage with and support Indigenous-led conservation and or Indigenous rights. Also, throughout this, uh, this development of the agenda, it became quite clear to us that we're not just dealing with gaps in knowledge production here, but also a real challenge in effective knowledge mobilization across all research themes that were identified. In the interest of time, I'll just go into the details on the first key theme, what we uh, what we uh, called the institutional barriers to conservation action. And so here participants were really focused on, uh, participant submissions and, and input was really focused on what barriers obstruct conservation decision-making across different levels or scales of governance. So they highlighted a lack of political will or polarization as having impacts on conservation outcomes, barriers or long-standing issues with informed decision-making with science and alternative forms of knowledge were also high highlighted, uh, as too were the barriers associated with the institutions that tend to structure social norms and behavior. So things like law and policy were also uh, noted. Much of this insight tracks with uh, the, the limited, but I would say growing literature on this topic of barriers to conservation decision-making. What's interesting here for us is the direct association to this being a challenge in the Yellowstone to Yukon region and a focus on better understanding the strategies that are most useful in, in overcoming barriers to very precise topics. So people mentioned land use planning, barriers to knowledge mobilization, as I mentioned, barriers to conservation oriented law and policy, et cetera. And this is a key point for us, that participants were not solely interested in diagnosing the problem, not just understanding what barriers are out there, but also in understanding how to overcome them to improve conservation decision making now and into the future. So again, there was many themes in the interest of time. I just touched on one, but happy to discuss the others uh, in our discussion later. Um, so really in conclusion, I just wanted to stress that you know, we feel we can help address the, the rather unprecedented challenges facing global mountain regions by improving our understanding of the social side of life in the mountains. So we argue in the paper that if we can improve our understanding of how people live in, play in, visit and benefit from life in the mountains and mobilize that knowledge effectively, we'll be able to better inform decision making. And with that, we have a few recommendations stemming from this work just quickly. Uh, first, we see this as a crucially important time to fund and support more applied and critical social science research throughout the Yellowstone to Yukon region and beyond. We feel this will help fill knowledge gaps and should also be connected to effective knowledge mobilization efforts. And on that point, we strongly recommend that decision makers recognize the value of social science research and alternative forms of knowledge. And we call also on the researchers um, conducting the work to be very strategic and intentional with their knowledge mobilization efforts, not only making this a central component of the research process itself, but also in paying attention to those um, barriers to evidence-informed decision-making um, um, uh, that may exist in, in the particular context. And then finally, we just recommend that uh, groups in similar regions, be it mountain or large conservation landscapes, undertake a, a similar type of assessment that helps identify gaps and challenges facing um, different subject groups throughout their, that respective region. So our method we feel is very adaptable uh, and, and has also contributed to strengthening of the, the social science network across the Yellowstone to Yukon region. So there's additional kind of benefits here to the, to the work, not just identifying research gaps, et cetera. And I'll just finish by saying, I think as social scientists, we, you know, in a, in a way we're, we're kind of working from behind amidst uh, multiple overlapping social and environmental crises. Uh, um, so taking steps to, to kind of strategize how to address those research gaps and knowledge mobilization um, in a rather systematic way is, is, is quite urgent. Um, and anyway, so that's, that's it for me today. I forgot to go to my thank you slide. You can find the paper um, through that QR code. Uh, and just a shout out that this project was um, uh, generously supported by MITACS Canada, the Wilberforce Foundation, and of course, the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. So thanks, uh, thanks again very much. And I look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Devin. And I see that we have already several questions in the chat. Um, I will uh, read them out if you can try to answer briefly. 
So have you addressed local perceptions as a key human dimension in restoration activities? Maybe I will read all the questions and then you can see how you want to address, maybe you want to, to join some of them. The second one by Rob Merchant, you mentioned the First Nation communities. So out of your responses, how many were from these communities? And then the third question on specific measures. So what specific measures or strategies does the Yellowstone to Yukon project propose to balance the promotion of mountain tourism with the preservation of the natural environment and wildlife habitats? Do we have time to, <laughs> to, to try to answer them now? Or? I think that uh, the first two, maybe you can briefly answer. The third one, maybe just a, a brief answer. We won't be able to go into detail, of course, on all the measures that we want to keep. Yeah, but sure. you can keep it for the discussion afterwards. We <laughs> okay. will have time for uh, discussion. I can answer Rob's question quickly, uh, I think, anyways. Um, the, the survey work, uh, was largely um, focused on um, engaging researchers, experts, etc. We have in the supplemental material in, in the paper a breakdown of where respondents um, um, are kind of employed, I guess. And the, the majority were from uh, the university sector, researchers, government agencies, and with a, with a gap uh, in, with those who were uh, employed by, by First Nation uh, either communities or organizations. There were a few, I forget the exact number out of the 40, it, it was relatively small, three or four or something like that, who again, of course, identified as such. Um, so uh, an area for improvement if we were to do this work again, um, for sure. Um, and then I, I can quickly touch on the third question too, if we have time, what specific measures or strategies does the Yellowstone to Yukon project propose to balance the promotion of mountain tourism? Uh, with the preservation of the natural environment and wildlife habitats. Um, I can say that uh, the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative at this time is, is really focused on um, better understanding the impacts of recreation on mountain ecosystems and wildlife, uh, and also the, the benefits of um, outdoor recreation and tourism uh, for communities, et cetera, throughout the region. And um, the, the main focus being on trying to promote um, responsible recreation. Uh, I can can start, I can stop there, um, I think for now, and then maybe come back to the other question. Thank you very much, Devin. And as you mentioned, uh, of course, your detailed study is available in, in the paper and the link is provided in the website of MRD. I will now invite our fourth speaker, Rob Marchant, who is Professor of Tropical Ecology uh, at the University of York in the United Kingdom. And he's also a member of the Mountain Research Initiative's Science Leadership Council. Rob, please. Wonderful, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, again, it's a, a pleasure to be here and talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing, I guess, really trying to understand past ecosystem change and how some of those insights from the past I think can particularly inform some of those contemporary issues around ecosystem restoration. Um, first off, I would like to acknowledge a, a whole body of people who have contributed to uh, sort of the work I'm going to uh, present. Um, so yeah, we we very much take uh, in our research group this sort of past um, to present to future perspective. I mean, myself, I started as a, a paleoecologist, but I think through my career of um, start, stopped looking down and back through time to looking forward and just trying to get ahead of some of the challenges. And I'll just show you some of the uh, the insights that have come from that past, present uh, and future perspective. So first of all, looking at the past, invariably it involves taking a core of sediment as Chamber Finch is, is doing here. And this is a really important site um, from some would say, and I would certainly say, uh, the hottest of the biodiversity hotspots around the world. So this is the Eastern Arc Mountains of Tanzania. Um, it's a 700 kilometer chain uh, of mountains, uh, 13 individual blocks. Um, and as we can see from the work of Gemma, um, these forests have changed massively. Um, so this goes back just about 1,300 or so years. 
Um, and we can see from the sort of nice, this sort of wavelet color diagram down here, fires have really taken off, particularly in the last 700 or so years, but nothing compared to what happened as we started to, or as this area of the world started to open up to international exploitation, initially through ivory trade, particularly, and associated with that removal of ivory from the landscape was the importation of new crops, uh, particularly maize. So as maize arrived into this area around about 1810, where we know it was brought in by the Portuguese at 1608 into Zanzibar, really fueling this massively exploitative um, history, um, that transform these landscapes. Large amounts of forest were cleared, agriculture expanded, and that uh, impact on our forests, or this particular um, Tanzanian biodiversity hotspot, really took off in that colonial period as the sort of forestry exploitation really uh, you know, massively ramped up. And we can see that with the decline of some of these key taxa. To give an idea, so here's the, again, the Eastern Arc Mountains. The gray area is the sort of paleoecological extent. So from our past perspectives, this is the, the potential land and ex potential extent of that really important biodiversity hotspot. Uh, the bits of colored um, 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 areas on the, on the map are bits of present day forest under invariably national park or um, forest reserve or community based forest reserve. Incredibly diverse, incredibly fragmented and increasingly threatened. And that obviously resonates with present day issues around carbon and trying to think about maximizing the carbon store uh, in these forests. And again, through a network of plots across the Eastern Arc and more broadly across African uh, equatorial African mountains, we've been able to really understand and get a better handle on that carbon um, storage. And as we see from the previous slide, the potential of these areas to restore. OK, so let's just think about the, the future in the second half of my, my talk. Clearly, there are massive challenges ahead around climate, around land use, around development, around population. Uh, clearly, climate is a, a massive one and uh, it's probably just relevant, I think, given uh, COP28 happening to think a little bit about some of the, the climate challenges on our African mountains. Uh, I know there's lots of debate around 1.5, 2 degrees, 3 degrees warming. We're clearly in, on an on a, uh, African mountain context, rainfall and precipitation and changes in seasonality and variability are massively key. Um, and again, we can see that just from this picture of the Tarangiri Basin in the dry season and in the wet season. Dry seasons have, as most of you have followed, there's been extensive droughts across the whole Horn of Africa for the last three years. And that's now been followed by really intensive flooding. Um, so that intensity, that variability of climates and, and, and changing climates causing massive challenges to our mountain communities. And those challenges are played out through the, the lens of land um, and one, one of the things we've done over the years is developed a, a tool, which we find very appropriate for working in our mountain systems, called, and we call it Keisho, which means tomorrow in Key Swahili. It starts off with that sort of participatory process. So we bring people together from different backgrounds, conservation organizations, academia, community-based organizations, uh, agro, agro industry uh, organizations, and then think a little bit about what the future of the land is and what's driving that future, be it policy, be it climate, be it um, community interventions. We then take all of that really rich, diverse narrative away, change pixels of land from one type to another, present that back to the communities uh, that have, have driven those, and then get some idea of, of, of how appropriate our modeling has been. We focus invariably on a, a near and a far future, resonating with the SDG and the, uh, in our case, the African Union's um, Agenda 2063. 
This is what some of the output looks like. Initially focused on carbon, just one scenario. So a business as usual, a green economy, both towards 2020, uh, 2030. The difference in carbon storage is around about $8 billion worth of, of carbon, just based on, our, on, on, on the value of carbon. Uh, clearly, a lot of this is focused around those mountains as well, the eastern mountains I mentioned. Again, we can take our tool and zoom into a mountain community. So focusing now on the Jima Highlands of uh, Ethiopia, an area of coffee production. Again, just looking at one scenario. So this is our 2030, uh, sort of pr present day. And this is the tw three visions of what it would be like in 2030 under a a future where land gets taken out of semi-managed uh, coffee production to a much more of an intensive agricultural future versus a, a, a semi-managed uh, coffee forest, which has high biodiversity value, high uh, watershed production value, high carbon value, versus a, a future where there's more intensive um, coffee um, plantation. So moving away from shade coffee to open open growing coffee. Um, just in my last couple of slides, just want to highlight a, a new working group coming from the Mountain Research Initiative that uh, the community is welcome to join. It's literally just starting this year. In fact, we've got our first planning meeting for it uh, in uh, next week. Uh, run for the next five years, really looking at these sort of mountain socio-ecological futures, how we can bring it, the community together, the science community, the practitioner community, to try and get ahead of some of those challenges. And this is on the back of last year, at sustainable mountain development. Okay, and I'd like to leave it with this slide, which really just highlights where we're taking some of our work in, in, in the coming five years, I guess. So certainly bringing together those sort of social eco ecosystem dynamics, thinking about rates and direction of change, certainly looking at the interactions between carbon, water, biodiversity, health, livelihoods, capturing that through, certainly through uh, working with, in, in collaboration with environmental economists, the whole sort of nature-based solution type approach. And certainly through um, training, I mean, one of the, the byproducts of this, this sort of participatory methodology is the, the training and the awareness that happens through the actual research process. So we've run now 42 workshops, so over, over a thousand people have come into this, this process. Uh, and that awareness about trying to think about the future and then get ahead of those challenges um is really quite empowering and thinking about whose voice is in in those rooms and with that i would like to pass it back to the organizers thank you thank you very much rob and i don't i know that in eight minutes of course we don't do justice to all of uh, your work but at least now we we know that this is available and we can get back to you uh, there is a question in the slide, a practical question regarding the PowerPoint slides. So after the talk, we will make available a recording with all the slides and also a link to resources that will be, um, some of them are already on our website and others provided by our speakers. And I see that there are a couple of specific questions um, to Rob. One, uh, what method was applied in estimating the monetary value of CO2? And the second one is about uh, the potential to restore biodiverse endemic forests where eucalyptus and perhaps monocultural replacement stands have changed the fire interval. So I, I don't know, Rob, if you can read uh, the questions yes. in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. If you could try to give just a brief answer and to those questions. Yeah. So the, the monetary value of, of, of carbon is a very easy one. It was just a back of the envelope calculation. So we basically took the carbon price at that particular point in time. We've got a value of tons of carbon per hectare between the different scenarios uh, and then translated that into the price. We have got a much more <laughs> evolved 
uh, way of doing it, uh, where we actually look at discounting of all of these values across space and through time. And again, we've just published on that, so I can make make those uh, available to uh, to anyone who's interested. Uh, the eucalyptus one is a really important one. So the choices of trees, you know, again, you know, it's about yeah having the right tree in the right place at the right time. Lots of afforestation with eucalyptus is really causing havoc, uh, particularly because of the water demand. Uh, and we see that, and, and then the impacts on soil and then ongoing fertility and all the problems it, it stores for many years down the line. Uh, and we're seeing many of those those problems starting to come come to fruition, particularly across the Ethiopian highlands. Um, so yeah, the eucalyptus one is a big challenge, um, and I'm sure that may may come up in 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 the, in the discussions that we go on with. Um, but I'd just like to highlight maybe some of the work by our COS at the moment. So the Alpine Rift Conservation Society, who are doing lots of work in Rwanda on ensuring that uh, yeah some of the the restoration particularly the forest restoration is taking place with the right um, you know, with the right tree in the right place um, but it's an ongoing challenge and certainly yeah eucalyptus has its own challenges thank you very much rob and with this i would like to close the first part of our talk and uh, now with all these great uh, introductions, well, inputs and uh, food for thought for discussion, we want to invite you to a more interactive part of the session. Um, I don't know if Suzanne, you could please share the slide. And what we will use is what we call an open space technology. I will briefly explain how it works. It's quite simple. And in the chat, you will also see the link to a Jamboard where we invite you to go. So either you can stay here in the Zoom room for the explanation, or you can also go directly to that Jamboard to see if you can um, if you can access it. Um, so the open space technology, the idea is that we do not want to define in advance what are the topics that we will discuss. So there are a lot of you uh, working on many uh, different issues and from different perspectives in different parts of the world, all interested about the topic of restoration in mountain areas, and more specifically about the role of knowledge and how we can best um, generate, share, and put into action knowledge to support restoration and conservation of mountain ecosystems. So what I would like you to, to do and to invite to you is to think of what is the conversation that you would like to have right now with some of the people who are here in the Zoom room, with our panelists and with the other participants. So in the second uh, slide of the Jamboard, you can write in a sticky note the topic of a theme that you would like to discuss about. And um, we will then possibly merge some of these topics. In the end, we will choose four to maximum five topics. And for each of the topic, we will have one host who will announce and convene the conversation. Then other among yourselves can be just participants. So you will be able to join the group that you're interested in and just participate in that conversation. We also have other types of participants who are the bumblebees who move from one group to the other. And then we have butterflies who might decide to take a time out to not be involved in any of this discussion to, to reflect. So the, the principle is that once we have defined our four to five topics, uh, we will prepare breakout rooms in the Zoom. And as I mentioned before, each of you will be able to join the room of your choice. Uh, you're also able to move around rooms as you wish. And this is what we call the law of mobility. 
So if you find yourself in a situation where you're not contributing or learning, just feel free to move to another room, right? And um, there are a few rules for the open space uh, technology. I can, I think you can see them here in the slide number one. So whomever comes to your room is the right people. Whenever it starts is the right time, but when it's over, it's also over. If you don't have anything else to contribute or if the discussion is over, that's fine. And whatever happens is the only thing that can happen. So it's really um, a time that we want to dedicate to these uh, more informal exchanges between, between you. So now I would like to ask you, if you have not done so, to click on the link in the chat to join this Jamboard and to go to slide number two. In slide number two, you will see there are a series of sticky notes. So you can click on them and please write the topic of your choice, the topic that you would like to discuss with someone. What is the conservation, the conversation, sorry, that we need to have now? Uh, if you're willing to host this conversation, please also add your name on that sticky note. If there are similar topics, we might then combine them. Also, one rule is that each host can only host one conversation. So if you propose to host a conversation, uh, do not volunteer to host a second one. So I, I will um, give you now a few minutes to just write your ideas of topics that you think are important and that you would like to further discuss related to the overall question of our talk, which is how can knowledge support restoration and conservation of mountain ecosystems for the benefit of people and nature? I see that some of you are, are already jumping in and proposing some topics. I think uh, that we will maybe stick to four groups so that we have also a little bit of time to report back. Um, so the first topic which was suggested, regenerative mountaineering, may I please ask uh, who, oh, sorry, I see that there is a new idea popping up. Um, so maybe Barriers to knowledge. I will just read all the topics and we will see how we can uh, maybe combine them. I propose that we will discuss in four groups. One, regenerative mountaineering. Um, the other one on sustainable management and restoration of mountain agroecosystems. So specifically agroecosystems. Development versus restoration of ecosystems. And then local community driven restoration and how to guarantee the transparency of process of knowledge integration. Sky Island's concept and integrity of biodiverse high mountain habitats. Okay, I see that we have a lot of different topics. What I would suggest, and, and I see that they are all quite different, actually not that easy to merge. What I would suggest, um, if you really want to have one of these, uh, to discuss one of these topics, please volunteer and add your name as a host. And um, and those who do not have volunteer hosts, we will map them as interesting topics, but we will not discuss them in breakout groups. So if you could please start doing that so we can see how many hosts we have. Please add in the sticky notes um, if you're willing, of course, to host the conversation. Uh, Devin will host a group discussion on barriers to knowledge. Pro uh, sorry, to knowledge production and knowledge mobilization. Hmm? This will be our first group. Hossein, who volunteers to host a discussion on regenerative mountaineering. Estefania, who volunteers to host a discussion on how to guarantee the transparency of knowledge, of processes of knowledge integration in restoration activities. 
Okay, so we already have three topics. So we have now these three topics. Barriers to Knowledge Production and Knowledge Mobilization, hosted by Devin. Regenerative Mountaineering, hosted by Hosein. And how to guarantee the transparency of process of knowledge integration in restoration activities, hosted by Estefania. Great. So we will create these three breakout groups. Uh, as I mentioned before, all the other participants, so we ask the host to stay in the room to host the discussion. The other participants are free to join any of these three topics and also to move from one to the other. I will ask the host uh, to stay in the room, of course, and then either the host or someone else, a rapporteur appointed by the group, should in the corresponding slide, so you will see in the Jamboard, we have the slides, uh, one slide per group, please document some of the main insights from your discussion. So make sure to document some of the main insights. If the host um, can do it, that's great. If the host is busy facilitating the discussion, maybe you can also appoint someone else from your group. You will have um, 10 minutes approximately to discuss in the groups. And then we will convene back uh, again in the plenary and we will ask each group so the host of each group to report back only one key insight from the discussion. The others will be there documented in the slide, but we will only have time to report back in the plenary one key insight you would like to share with the other participants. So I hope that everything is clear. We will now create uh, the three different rooms in Zoom. If you have any technical problem, please ask for assistance in the chat and someone will help you. So I think we're all back in the plenary. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was uh, quite short. I know we would need a full day to explore all these uh, topics and have uh, more in-depth conversations. But uh, may I please ask the host of each group to just share one key insight in one minute, just to give the rest of us a glimpse of uh, some of the things you have discussed. So can I invite Devin, can you, would you like to share just one idea, one insight from your conversation? Sure, yeah, actually, I think it's quite easy to do because our conversation uh, was almost exclusively revolving around some of the, the barriers, but all, or, or the kind of uh, positives and, and negative, um, let's say opportunities and challenges to using um, things like mobile technology in the, in the research process and how that can, um, uh, you know, um, make uh, the research process more, more equitable, more mobile, more accessible for, for folks, but also how it comes with its own limitations in terms of accessing the, being able to access those technologies, um, um, you know, sustaining the use of those tools over long periods of time, whether it's mobile phone technology for data input or, or, or something else entirely. So our conversation tended to, to focus there. It was quite interesting. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Devin. Thank you very much. Let's move to group number two, which was on regenerative mountaineering. I hear you, there was some, um, problems in accessing the Jamboard, but maybe Hossein, you could share just orally with us uh, one key insight from your conversation. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm talking here from the University of Alberta, but I came from Iran working 10 years as a mountain guide in Demovan. So in our room, me and Krishna, we both have the same background. Krishna is working as mountain guide also in Nepal. And right now he's doing some research in mountains. And so after a lot of years, uh, I found that this topic is uh, somehow interesting, regenerative mountaineering, because the main focus of the regenerative is about revitalization. 
of the mountain, not only about the mountain environment, but only about, but also about the uh, culture. And recently, some uh, people like previous alpinists, they are criticizing where is the role of adventure in mountaineering uh, tour. And what is the relation of adventure to this topic, to the regenerative? When we do the mountain tourism, it goes to the commercialization and go to the over-tourism and the mass tourism. But the idea of the alpinism and the adventure side is going to mountain with the few uh, negative effects on mountain. And uh, this is uh, one of the topics that came to my mind recently. Of course, I knew here and the first term here in this university, I need a lot of time. But in our room, we quite talk about this uh, topic that was uh, interesting. And Martha has a question. We didn't have time to answer Martha's question, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Hossein. And I see that Martha um, also provided her contact in the chat. So I encourage you to continue some of these discussions and, and conversations outside the talk. So let's go now to group number three. And Estefania, I would like to invite you to share one insight you had from your group discussion. OK, thank you very much for your attention and the participation of the people who joined to my room. So I'm going to summarize uh, the ideas. Uh, the main idea is the documentation of the process of knowledge integration, but this documentation needs to be through the participation of local people, local partners. So the main idea is the inclusion of local partners in uh, countries and also to provide more funding to the process of knowledge integration and during the meetings to make this knowledge visible. And also uh, a good comment was the facilitating and honoring and integrating the perspectives needs, uh, the perspectives of local communities. Um, basically do more, a more integ integral participation of local communities in the restoration activities. So that is the main ideas of the discussion uh, of my role. Thank you so much, Stefania. And unfortunately, we're already getting uh, towards the end of our talk. One hour and a half is not enough to explore all these issues. But I will just like to um, summarize three points, I think three important recommendations that came from all of these inputs from first from our panelists, but also from the discussions, some recommendations, you know, on how knowledge can support restoration and conservation of mountain ecosystems. So several of you really highlighted the importance of engagement, inclusion, um, and collaboration, inclusion of different actors, different types of knowledge. And of course, this comes with um, a lot of challenges, right, to be implemented in practice. A second point which was made very clear is the importance of the robustness of and the um, um, systematic way and standardized way in which information should be collected and documented in order to be able then to inform policy making. And a third point uh, was the importance of integrating um, knowledge and understanding about the dynamics of social ecological systems and in particular uh, views from social sciences, but also environmental historical perspectives on the past, but also in order to uh, model future scenarios uh, are extremely important to orient uh, interventions and policy making. So uh, I, I, I know that I cannot do justice to all of the wealth of, um, of insights you gave us, but uh, these are the three points I wanted to highlight. I would like to thank all our panelists, all our participants for this very rich uh, interaction. We will prepare a blog with the main insights from all of these um, inputs, and this will be available on our website. So thank you so much again, and in particular to our panelists, but also to all of you participants. Thank you.